Dalai Lama told me that I should honor all living creatures, especially listeners of the podcast known as Trapped Under Plastic, the podcast where the Ninjan and the Miniac clans come together to design evil plans for taking over the miniature world. <laughs> yes. They figured it out. Well, they, they They got to it. Um, it took four full seasons, kind of season five. Mm-hmm. But the goody peepees have finally discovered our true nefarious plan. Yeah, with 30 minutes of prep and us sitting in these chairs two and a half hours, we will take over the world in 102 years. <laughs> I, I still think we would probably have like 40,000 listeners at that point. <laughs> like, the people that listen to this podcast, God bless you, <laughs> each and every one of you, for for listening to this podcast. Because you may not understand it, but our niche is pretty small yeah <laughs> we're not going to get the people that listen to the big podcast listen to this podcast but you out there you goody peepees are the reason why we do it and so so thank you for that um i want to do a little quick transition because at the end of the podcast I, I meant to talk to scott about this prior but i'm just going to talk to him about it right now at the end of the podcast <laughs> we always tell you how you can support the podcast and i know from all the podcasts i listen to kind of once they get to that part at the end of the episode I just turn on a new episode, so I kind of miss it. So what a lot of people do, Scott, is at the beginning of the episode, they say, you know, we this podcast only exists truly because of the support of our patrons. If yeah. we're being 100% honest with, yep. with you guys and with ourselves, um, that that little bit of money um, that y'all bring us means that Scott can keep the space here that we get to use. It means that I'm driving up an hour and a half and driving home an hour and a half to record this. The work that we do, the, the wonderful um, little uh, writer we have, James, that we can pay him. Um, our editor, Blair, we can pay him. And that only ha- happens because y'all are, are amazing people. So for a couple bucks um, a month, you can support us there. Or for five bucks a month, um, you get the extended version of the podcast. Mm-hmm. The after party, we, we've got a couple of uh, truly hidden segments that you can hear about there. It's another about 30 minutes in extended length. Um, I don't know if you had anything else to say, Scott, but just thank you all for your support. Um, it's surprising. Yeah, <laughs> I would say that the support we get on Patreon garnishes over 50% of all of the income the podcast makes at the very least. So that's the majority of our income. So this this truly wouldn't be like a, a financial viability to have like John drive down here like an hour and a half each time to record an episode if if not for that. So we're truly grateful for sure. All right, now I'm done with that sappy bullshit. <laughs> um, not bullshit. It's it's not. It's not. It really is. And we we talk about it sometimes. It's just not on camera of, of how lucky we are and how gracious we are that we get to do this. And it means that we get to have these weird fucking conversations that we really enjoy having, and we're just doing it into a microphone instead of over ten D's. <laughs> we also do them over ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Both happen really. Yeah. All right, out of the preamble ramble, this is the second time we're doing this because I forgot to put record on the fucking audio recorder. <laughs> Kill me. There was a whole bit about Home Alone. Home Alone. Trust and us. Kevin, like Colin McCulkin and everything. Yeah, we we had. Let's give them. Let's give them like the thirty second pitch. So <laughs> we were thinking about a movie where Macaulay Culkin grows up. Yeah. And he's still playing with marbles and BB guns and firecrackers. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But now he's just more lethal. Yeah, so he is an adult. It, it's it's starring uh, Macaulay Culkin as he is X years old today. Like, he's in, like, his mid-40s or something. Uh, he's about the same age as me, I think. Um, but Home Alone 4 is him as an adult, and he's, like, vigilante going after these people <laughs> that, are, that are, like, small-time, like— no uh no violent crimes criminals yeah, yeah, <laughs> fucking yeah. batman batman batman's the shit out of them he's child batman yeah, with with marbles and firecrackers and a bb gun okay yeah. y'all can picture it we need, <laughs> we need to start a petition i can't like connect the dots exactly how we got there based no. on it was something to do with the intro you read uh world domination yes it was yeah. Talk about talk about cal traps made from sprue frames and yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. It was that was a pretty. It's seven degrees of Kevin Bacon. It was logical. Trust us. It was it was, it was really smooth. It was unhinged. We got to Home Alone four. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen two and three? 
Uh, when I was a kid, I know I've seen. Oh, I've seen two for sure. The one that's the one with Donald Trump, right? Where he's in New York. Oh yeah, and like the word "bird guy." Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I've ever seen three. Okay. Is there a three? There's a three. Is there? I, I, Maybe I'm just making that up. There's, there's a three. There probably is. There probably is. Oh, isn't Home Alone three with a different kid? Uh oh, is it? Uh, did they make a new one? A modern one? It's not that new, but but yeah, I think it's a different kid. Okay. It, okay. Anyway, these are the these are the dumb things, things that we Google. <laughs> Uh, so, Scott, you had some pretty big news out of the fucking blue. Guild Ball. Yeah, Guild Ball. What the fuck? It's back? Is it back? We don't know. The devs, as of two days ago, um, released a video on their channel uh, kind of lightly apologizing for um, how they exited and ended the game's life um and then kind of explained how they're going to bring it back so if you don't know a while back guild ball said it was going to end its production and they kind of low-key blamed the community for the direction the game went in they cited examples where if they released a character it was uh instantly god tier or trash labeled by the community and everyone cared about just like having the most amazing team and not having like a fun fluffy experience and that wasn't the direction they wanted the game to go in. And a lot of a lot of the community felt like they, they were being blamed for the end of their game. Um, and so a lot, a lot of uh, uh, hurt feelings there. So they put a video out and like, we're going to refresh the rules in collaboration with a project called the Guild Ball Community Project, which has been basically a steward to the rule set ever since the game ended. They've been updating it lightly, making it more balanced. They're going to refresh the models and have them available as STLs and also print on demand. So they like increase the size of ankles and updated certain things because they've made a lot of models now for a lot of Kickstarters, as you know. Um, and so they've, they've grown in that capacity. And they're also, uh, one of, I didn't hear this in the video, but one of my followers told me that they're releasing the entirety of the Kickstarter box set, which is their starter set, which has Brewers and Masons for free, all in STLs. Um, so basically, Guild Ball isn't going to be actively developed at the moment, but at least it's officially supported in a way, kind of in like an archival way, by Steamforge. So if you want to find models for the game, you can. And the rules you said they they tweaked and are updating the rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they refresh the rules and also the models. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty cool. And they also they also kind of they also kind of put in there. Um, if the game gets enough like interest and traction, they'll be willing to put more developmental hours into it, which this is all good news to me. I was super happy to hear this. I was never really upset. Like I, I didn't feel like I was being blamed for the end of the game. A lot of people did. Um, so I didn't have too, too many emotions wrapped up in that. So I felt really great. But the comments on that video, my God were incredibly irate. Everyone was so angry with them. They were saying this is a cash grab. They were saying that the apology was was half-assed. Like, it wasn't sincere at all. Like, there are a lot of angry people in those comments. Yeah. I mean, you have to put yourself in the shoes of those developers. If you, di if you dig way deep in the apology thing, like, that, that's a hard for you to transition into the excitement or in the, the good news that you're trying to give today. That's hard to do. Um, and you need somebody that's like a public relations specialist write that. Yeah. Um, and in the miniature world, Steamforge games and companies of the like, just they don't have that person or maybe that skill set or maybe the nuanced understanding of that. But they're probably right. Maybe it could have been a little bit more from the heart, but also maybe that doesn't mean that they don't care. Maybe it just means that they're just trying to communicate in the way that they think is uh, is best. And that's OK, too. But yeah. Yeah, that's that came out of nowhere. I just thought, yeah, for I don't sure. know. Um, I'm, I'm honestly, for my own like, uh, my own reasons, I'm excited that they have won the free uh, STLs, but also even the print on demand. I'm willing to pay money for some of these if they're redone and they're nice quality sculpts to print, because I love using Guild Ball minis for D and D. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because we've used a number of our characters over the years um, for our PCs, or even like really important NPC minis that we use in our games, our Guild Ball characters, because one, they're really nicely detailed. They really give a good, unique fantasy look where they're certainly fantasy, but they don't just feel like a generic knight. Um, you can have a lot more character to them. They're, they're fun to paint, um, and their scale is really on par with other D&D &D minis, where like, 
Age of Sigmar minis are they just look like whatever that Age of Sigmar mini is. It's a giant. <laughs> like <laughs> they're so much taller and thicker, and there's like, oh yeah, my dude's forearm is bigger than your dude's torso, and we're supposed yeah. to be this, we're supposed to be like both six foot humans. It's just like it did. So Gilball just does a lot of things really right. So I'm excited to be like, oh, I can just get what I need. And if I, when I'm out there looking for my next character or an NPC for my campaign, um, which I've started my new campaign D and D now, and so I'm I'm gonna have another well to dig from. What uh, would you pick to play as? What do you mean? Oh, I it's my I'm the DM. Oh, you're oh right, you're the DM. Okay, I'm yeah, the DM now. So yeah, I play everything. <laughs> I play them all like fiddles. All right, what what do you got for the preamble ramble? Um, first one, I got a I got a new camera. Oh, so I when I say I got a new camera, I mean I bought a new camera like three months ago. <laughs> um, it was like a Black Friday, or it was no, it was even before Black Friday, and because I had this like oh shit moment where the the view finder or like your little screen on your camera, the one above my painting station, just stopped working. Um, I could still look through it, but the touch screen stopped working, which was means the camera is still fully functional. I just have to go through the little scroll wheel and do all that kind of stuff. But it it's surprising how much that like impeded my workflow. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just you're so used to doing something. and You're like, no, no, you can still do the thing, but you have to do it in a different way. And it's three times longer, even though it's not a lot of work. So I'm like, I've been meaning to get a new camera anyway. I ordered the GH6 um, Panasonic GH6. And it's been just sitting on my desk for like three months. And I finally like, I just need to sit down. I need to figure this fucking thing out. Watch some videos. Um, went through all the settings like by myself for like an hour and just kind of like fiddled with everything and set up the things I know in my GH4 that I had set, you know, with your zebras and all the kind of things that you settings I know that I use. And then I asked Scott for a bunch of help on, on the new things for this and getting a lot and whatever. And, and my first video, the video where I paint the dog, which by the time this comes out, will be out. Um, that video would be the first video that I've painted with the new camera. And we'll see how the footage looks, but the color, um, what's the word? Accuracy. Color accuracy is so much better on this one, yeah. um, specifically reds. Yeah, reds, oranges, sometimes yeah. yellows. Those those warmer tones, really, especially reds, really are struggled to render on digital cameras yeah they just it don't feel right and i can't tell you how often i am editing a video and i'm like that doesn't look like what it looks like yeah you know it like it artificially pumps stuff when it doesn't get the color accuracy correct the camera like tries to like they you know they design it to try to make up for shortcomings and it doesn't feel accurate it doesn't mm -hmm. look right and so i'm really excited to to do this so that's, yeah. that's the one little fiddly thing that i've been doing in relation to my hobby um outside of a lot of painting all right um i put out my second episode of kill your friends and i'm so happy that it's done and i'm so happy that it's out there and i'm so happy with the uh the outcome of the video um uh it was such a culmination of so many things um the night before the video published um i had curtis come to the office and we set up the projector and we just did a little baby premiere of it. We watched it together. Oh. And that was a lot of fun. That was super meaningful. Um, I mean, I, I always learn so much when I try out a new video uh, thing um, or a thing I don't do very often. And that's the same is true on this project. I learned a lot about how to edit um, a battle report, how to what to keep in, what to keep out. Um, and it, it was a huge learning experience, but it's an awesome video. I'm really proud of it. And I'm glad it's out there. Um, and I, I, I want to make more. I don't. Obviously, it's not going to happen very often because they're very challenging to do. They're very um, time intensive too. But that being said, I think that the biggest barrier to entry for me is having my own painted stuff. And I have a painted kill team. I have a painted Age of Sigmar fucking army. Um, now I just need to have painted terrain and an opponent who has an army that's also painted. Mm -hmm. And like that, that could happen, you know. Um, so yeah, I think Kill Team is a really good one. Yeah, you think so? Yeah. Um, I, just have to, <laughs> I have to just learn the cover rules of that game because they're so fucking archaic and weird, and I don't understand them. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that I, I'm I love it. It's fun. I love changing the kinds of videos that I make. It's so much fun for me to change the the editorial style. Um, but I'm just happy. I'm happy it's out. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Yeah, I will look through. I've got a whole bunch of a 
like unbuilt terrain stuff. I have so much shit for, from the fantasy side, so I can certainly help you out for the terrain side for that. You gonna paint I'll it? Check. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, we can find somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we probably can. We can find someone to help us with that. But um, but I'll check. I think I have I have some cool stuff for uh, fantasy too. That would be good for kill team. So we our forces combined, we can we can get you a cool um, terrain table for whatever you need. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but that's exciting. And and I, I have something I've been wanting to talk to you about with that video. And then, and it, it's totally different. But also, I've I've felt like when. You, that video launched the same day my video where um, where I painted the three heads launched, and I felt when we get into what we painted, I want to talk a little bit about that because I think like in some ways we were on a similar wavelength of doing something different, having some expectations be different, and then it coming out um, feeling like I felt really good. It wasn't like, oh, this is my top performing video or my top – three even performing videos in my last 10 it, it certainly wasn't it's been um, in a weird way it's been my least performing well performing video over my last 10 it has but i'm really happy with it and i'm really happy with the kind of the the feedback i'm getting with that so i can talk with about that a little bit nice. but nice. um the last thing i want to talk about in the preamble ramble is um golden demon <sighs> all right so the the exhale says it all. Yeah. So as the goody peepees might know, if you've been watching my channel lately and in listening to <laughs> Tup lately, you might know that I've been painting a lot for Golden Demon lately. And I'll tell more about that today as we have another figure painted uh, for Golden Demon. But that means that like I, I, I like transform, not like a transformer, more like a go bot. And I <laughs> When I get into painting for competition mode, like it envelops me in like wholeheartedly. All of me changes. Um, and I don't think in a bad way. When I'm sitting uh, uh, sitting on the couch at night for a little bit, just checking through stuff on my phone, social media, answering emails, playing with my dog, playing fetch with my dog, washing the dishes those kinds of moments in life where you get to mentally kind of like just spend time in your own temple of the things that you like to think about things you like to, you know, plan for um, things like you want to, uh, what, what am I going to do when I get some free time? Oftentimes my brain will go to like video games. It'll go to like planning my next commander deck for magic or trying to figure out combos. It could be like, you know, going through cards in my head on the new magic set to draft i spend a lot of mental energy on these things when i hit f like my stride of painting for competition and this inevitably has to be spaced out over a good portion of time i hit this this wavelength where it's like my brain is just there my free time to think about or my free time to actually act on my hobbies whether that's video games or that's painting for my own armies whether that's magic is now all in painting for competition okay. and i fucking love it i okay. love that that's where my brain goes because i feel like i am dialed in i'm i'm excited to get back to the table and work on a project because long projects will fucking grind you and it's a resolve can you do it and i don't mean that in a negative way i don't mean that painting for a competition should be viewed as you have to bleed in hopes for something coming out on the other side. There is enough of small victories in seeing your own improvement in, in the excitement of a project coming together that I really feel that there are little successes, but when it gets to you, it's like, it's all I'm thinking about. So because I'm in that mindset, my fucking radar is tuned in to any, any like waves across the atmosphere about Golden Demon. <laughs> And it's fucking radio silent games workshop. I did not think this was going in this direction. I thought you were just like happy to be like swimming in it, you know, like I, in the mode. You're like riding the wave. I am. I am. And I do not want to get off the board. You know what I'm saying? I want to keep riding it. Yeah. And so that's where I'm transitioning to this side of it where <laughs> all these people around the planet right now are in a similar boat to me or are going to start a project or are thinking about starting a project. Maybe they're going to go to Adepticon. Should I paint something for it? Now is the time to really, to for you, if you haven't started yet, go to PPs. If you're coming to Adepticon, paint something for Golden Demon, goddammit, or paint something for the Creature <laughs> Caster 
uh, Creature Caster painting competition or paint something for the Marvel Crisis Protocol paint competition. Paint something. Bring it there. You will thank me. It will be worth it, no matter if you can spend 20 hours or 200 hours. It is worth it for you as a painter to just do it, just like Shia LaBeouf says. Sure. And, um, and so because my radar is up to this, the, the radio silence is deafening how this company has not even released the rules, the FAQ, anything. And we are less than two months away. And they have not said shit about if and when they're doing a UK Golden Demon. This should have been announced like a month, two months ago of their announcement of when Golden Demon at Warhammer Fest or whatever it should be for the UK to be on track for the for the spring. This is like a month after Nepcon, right? Uh, yeah, a little over, like six weeks, I think. Something like that. Maybe five. Um, but they haven't said anything. Yeah. And I just, I just want it to be the thing that all of us love and people that are new to the hobby or have not experienced... Um, either competitive painting or painting at the highest level or just, just trying to improve and looking for inspiration or what's a possible out there. It's just such a great example of that. And I just hate to have it not be given what it deserves. So. Yeah. I think one thing that great companies understand, and I know that GW understands this, but maybe they just don't put, they just don't put value in it, is that doing things that don't necessarily make money but make your community happy um, is a stock you can invest in, you know, mm -hmm. like running a community event um, or like, I mean, GW has like brought back things like squats or like whatever stuff like that shows good faith. Um, ha caring about golden demon shows good faith. And maybe you're going to invest X dollars and it's not going to return those dollars, but what you're going to get is something much greater. You're going to like, have people that love your product and your brand for their life right yeah. Yeah. and they're going to continue to support you forever and so i think if you can invest in that you win long term right yeah uh, it's not all short gains yeah i mean pepsi doesn't spend 10 million dollars on a super bowl ad because over the next month they're going to send they're going to make 10 million dollars more in product sales because of that ad it's product awareness, it's brand awareness, it's drawing connection and having long-term customer base and <laughs> connectivity to your products. Yeah. That's why they do it. And so this is that. This is building a, a connectivity, um, an attachment to your brand, um, building in a new next generation of people excited about your products because all what, what you're doing is, is selling figures and books and this is a great way to sell figures long term. Um, and so, you know, it, you know, if it costs you a couple grand to do it, I, I feel like it's a worthy investment. But then again, I'm not in charge of their marketing communications team, but I did do that for a living at one point. So <laughs> what do I know? Right. <laughs> um, that's that's it. I, I, I got to quit talking about that. Well, all right, because uh, I have a very sad, empathetic what we painted section i'll have one more preamble ramble okay and that is it is finally happening the eu and uk and row rest of world fulfillment is happening it is started uh for my kickstarter campaign which is the last bit of physical fulfillment that needs to happen before the entire thing is done uh, i just read an email this morning um, that said that we have shipped everything other than six orders that just need extra product, um, and it'll be done. Um, when are we gonna have the 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 post launch party where we get naked and like champagne everywhere? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we're ju we're only wearing goggles, just like we won the World Series, so they don't get champagne and beer in their eyes. <laughs> when I finish the editing of the masterclass courses, which is what I have been doing. Ever since I finished the Kill Your Friends uh, video, I have paused all sponsorship. I've paused all YouTube videos, and I'm just, I'm just working on that. Um, and I'm sorry I haven't updated my backers on anything. I've been sick for the last uh, four or five days, um, so I haven't spoken about the beginning of this fulfillment. Today is the first day that I feel like a regular person, even though I, I sound a little bit congested. Um, but yeah, so that is, um, I'm not allowing myself to feel the weight off my shoulders just yet because i have a lot of work to do um mm -hmm. edit edit wise um but the the 
the fact that I don't have to deal with, uh, I mean, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a big thing. The, the, sca- thing. the scary things, the things that are most frustrating and most stressful that I find in work in, in however long I've been working on this planet have been the things that you, you really rely on, but they're out of your control. Yeah, dude. You need to happen, but you can't make them happen yourself. Yeah. I, I hate fucking relying on people. <laughs> I Honestly, it. it's yeah, I hate it. it. It's rough. You really, you really are at some point just entirely at their mercy. Yep. And it's like you, you know, you can't do anything. Um, and I fought like that for like a long time. Okay, like a really long time. So here's my, uh, here's my recommendation. Okay. Um, two months. Just under two months from now, we'll be Adepticon. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'll be there by then, for sure. Then, why don't we set the celebration for the Kickstarter officially in the rearview mirror? Just like just like the scary guy in Jeepers Creepers. We just ran him over. He's laying in the middle of the road. He's <laughs> certainly dead for sure this time. <laughs> and uh, this is our, our celebratory drive off to the sunset, and that will be going to Adepticon. And then we will have, like, maybe it's... The first night, maybe it's uh, that Wednesday when we're doing the meet and greet with the fans and stuff. Maybe maybe it'll be Tup Live on Thursday night. We will say this is our um, Kickstarter is officially done. You can now shed all of your, your stress and your worry and just uh, revel in that you completed a thing and to be proud of that thing and and then Naked Champagne. Okay. As long as it ends in naked champagne. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's just me and you in the room this year. <laughs> That'd be so sad. Dude, it's just going to be great. We're just going to be in there just being like, woo! <laughs> and then Vince will knock on the door and it'll be like, hey, Vince. And he just like leaves. <laughs> he's, he just looks in there and we're just like, what? <laughs> sure. <laughs> He just he's got his fucking green apron on and he just pulls out these fucking ski goggles out of there. I've been preparing my whole life for this. <laughs> he's in only a green apron and ski goggles. Oh man. All so right. good, so good. Uh so that's your long winded way of saying you didn't paint anything this week, right? Yeah, yeah. Um I just I all I did was editing and um the last week and then this week I I've just been sick and I've been you know, okay. You I f- know, I fucking hate getting sick. Um, and normally I'm terrible when I'm sick. I don't do the right things to like get healthy faster. But this fucking time, I did. I'm talking sleep. I'm talking sauna. I'm talking showers. I'm talking physiotherapy. I'm talking like vitamins. I'm talking medication. I did all these things, and I was still sick for four fucking days. And I like, it's such a, it's such a waste of time. Uh, Isn't it? Doesn't it feel like you just do nothing? Yeah, and like I, it was like debilitating. I, I couldn't like, I almost couldn't like walk up the the basement stairs. Um, I was no like, energy. I had drained. no energy. I had like a headache. I had stomach aches. I had back pains. I'm like, I'm honestly still sweating right now. He might even smell me. Uh, I was sweating so much, but I was freezing cold. It was it was awful. The yeah. only redeeming thing was that I like I watched a decent amount of movies. Yeah, that's um, good. That's but. Good that was it it does kind of smell like ass and cheetos in here <laughs> that's yeah. definitely me yeah so okay yeah I, I know that feeling and the, the crappiest part about it is is like it's all the unknown about you did <coughs> you did all these good things and there's no way to know that it's like oh you would have actually been sick for 10 days but you did these things that's true that's the other thing and like yeah. now now you're only sick for four days yeah but you don't know that yeah i yeah. mean like you could have been you know fucking skydiving and drinking jack daniels the whole time and still been sick for four days yeah you just don't know. So you just kind of like, well, I just this is me trying to be an adult and doing the right things and hoping it's for the best. So. Yeah. Amber said that to me as well, which is definitely, definitely true. I think one thing I learned was I ate my first like real full meal yesterday. Um, and after I ate it, it was, you know, it had brown rice, had veggies in it, a little bit of protein. Um, I was like reincarnated after I had like mm. real food. I felt like, OK, now I have strength. It was crazy. And so this morning, I never eat breakfast, but I woke up and I ate like eggs and fruit and toast, um, and I, I feel like a million bucks right now. Good, yeah. Your body's telling you it's time. It's time. Sweat it all out. <laughs> uh, so I did paint some things. Hell yeah! What we got? What we starting um, at? So first thing, I painted three heads. Uh, I did a video where I painted uh, three Space Marine heads in uh, sixty minutes, thirty minutes, and ten minutes, and um, I found that. 
this video probably more than maybe any video I've ever done, but for sure in, in quite a while, I really kind of got crunchy in it, in my descriptions and walking through each step and walking through the why and walking through the how to execute on each step. And, and how, I, how I, asked, I asked in the video um, at the end, I asked people like, this is a little bit off of, I, I, I like to have some parts of education where through any of my videos where like hopefully you'll gather one or two things but it's awful lot to just to have it all, which is one of the reasons why I did just ahead to, because I wanted to get deeper into it to explain what I've learned and what I've developed in, in painting heads in specifically because the face is even more nuanced than just skin in general, skin on your arms, skin on your legs for a mini that you paint um, there. It's, it's just kind of different. And I had a great response. People just, they, they appreciated it. They, they, I got a lot of um, tags on people that have tried it. It feels like it's approachable enough to try and, uh, and to come out with something um, that is typically one of the big pain points um, in painting a mini is, is how do I not make the face look like Garbo? Um, and so trying to, to share that. So I felt pretty good about that. The 30 minute one and the 60 minute one, um, they're both about the same quality. <laughs> no, they're not. Okay, so let me guess. This is short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ten minute one. I haven't watched obvious. the video, so okay. I, I don't know. That, that's short. That's medium. I can't see the mini. Yep, that's medium. Yeah, and this is this is there's definitely it's definitely a cut above. Yep, I can tell when you get it when you when they're in your hand and you can really turn it around and really get up close and look at it with your naked eye. I think there's a difference. On camera, it's hard. It's hard. It's harder. Yeah, I mean, like this thing is the size. It's smaller than a fucking pea, guys. It's like this is hard to capture this, the difference in these things. Um, you need like, I don't even know what you need sometimes. But yes, but I I really enjoyed that, and I really felt like I, um, like it was kind of it was because it's all fresh in my my head of like painting for Golden Demon, and painting trying to paint a clean, uh, crisp style that still has depth of color um that's a thing it's not just like well you do a cadian flesh tone over the whole face and then you do and you do a some, wash and then you do a wash or even you do a glazes and whatever it's like no it's just kind of brown on brown on on pinks and whatever it's like adding in the depth of color with browns and reds and even some greens and some blues and and um going up into more yellows for for highlights and stuff it's like how do you have that clean style but still have the the depth and it it doesn't need to be super complicated to add that. Each of those steps is not tough to execute. It's just knowing which steps to do and which ones you can cut as you're trying to save more time. And I learned in 10 minutes. <laughs> it is so hard. Um I think it's I think it's fine. Yeah, I think it's I it's solid. It's actually a decent starting point, but it's like you have no room to think. You're just like yeah. you're running as fast as you can run. So did you did you do the longest one first? Is that how you did this? Yes. Okay. And I think that's why the that's the reason why the thirty minute one looked as good as it did. Because I did the thirty minute one as soon as I was, I was done with the one hour one. Okay. So it was all the steps and everything was fresh in my brain. So then I just like I on the fly I had to figure out what am I cutting? What steps am I cutting? What steps am I shortcutting? But I, I just know what the things I need to do. So there's no hemming and hawing. Yeah. Um, whereas if you went the other way, if you go shortest to longest, I find it's harder to get tangible takeaways and learning moments for yourself in that. Um, whereas if you're starting with the your most freedom of time and I, ideally the, the most quality outcome, then you can know what the possibilities are and learn about what you can take away or what you can speed up or what you can, um, you know, shortcut and find where what makes you happiest. It's like, yeah, you know, I think I think you, you may say, I think the one hour one looks so much better than what I can currently achieve in 30 minutes that I just need to be OK with painting an hour on faces. And if you do that for 10 faces, guess what? That hour will now take you 50 minutes or 45 minutes mm -hmm. because it's repetition. Um and that was one of the, the big takeaways. It's like anything you do will take you longer the first time you do it. It's pretty obvious. But we, in the world of mini painting of 
focusing on speed painting and that's, that's if everyone wants to know how to do it the fastest as possible the best way to become a fast painter is being okay with a slow painter first and just paint you'll become a fast painter it's just how it works yeah you kind of develop a taste for an outcome that you're happy with and they try to emulate like 80 percent of that outcome with speed painting so if you right. have a target in mind initially going into it it's helpful to understand like the direction to go in yeah I think that's one of the things and we've talked about it before that it's important to remind ourselves of as painters that one of the big differentiators between the best painters in the world and maybe the tier or two below them or even average painters like us is the level of quality they can get to quicker means that they can spend more time with that nuanced stuff if they want to because they can get to this you know really nice quality a b plus painted mini so much faster than i can mm -hmm. um so i need to put in my hours to maybe um either make up for that with spending more time or just paint more often and eventually i'll get i'll close that gap yeah and something to remind you guys about i know painting faces for a lot of people is intimidating and there's a lot of techniques that are intimidating but it is really intoxicating when you start to grasp something and get good at it then you want to just do it more and more and more yeah. and more so in the beginning it's going to feel awkward and it's going to feel painful and you're going to be like, man, I suck at this. But then the more you do it and the better you get at it and the more mental notes you make about, oh, I like that little move I did right there or I like that color that I used right there. And you build this little arsenal of these things that you enjoy um, that create a, a face or a technique that you think looks good. Um, then it's just like now it's, our, now it's in your toolkit and now you feel confident in it and you enjoy doing it. It's enjoyable to do things you're good at, which might sound obvious but it's that's encouraging enough for me to try out a new thing and get to that like somewhat experienced uh level in yeah yep because i think for a lot of miniature painters the face is the most daunting or the most frustrating or the least desirable part to paint i was that way when i was new and then now it's my favorite part like i would just paint faces and not have to do all the whole thing if, if it didn't look nearly as cool but it looks way cooler when the whole thing's painted so whatever mm -hmm. uh and the other thing i painted was i painted the doggo for the golden demon piece um and so god damn that was really fun i found that i really am enjoying painting aminals um you i like just, all of the musculature yeah the organic nature you can't hide behind edge you know edge highlights you can't hide behind this plane is faced this way so it's painted this way this plane is faced this way um you have to be able to deal with the smoothness of shapes and how light hits the shapes um and as they're all connected to be one flowing thing which is an animal body um and then dealing with the texture of the fur and how fur in in real life is like it's not just like well it's just all brown they're just all brown it's all the same color brown everywhere it's like you well know, it doesn't really exist N not too often anyway um so working with that it was just so much fun but it's it is difficult too um i i don't think that i'm amazing at it but i think that um i'm, I'm for the most part pretty happy with that puppers um can i ask you about the lines on his forehead yeah, so he's got these these like wrinkles that kind of go back, and I I wanted those pronounced because that's on the forehead, just like you're painting any face. You one you want to draw more attention to the face is important, and and two you want to over accentuate some of those details on and around the face a little bit. And as I painted them, um, those are raised sections of its head that I thought well you know they should be brighter. Um, at some point maybe they look too much like a stripe. But I, I, at first my thought was like they're just more accentuated highlights. But then I kind of liked a little bit of, of extra attention drawn there as opposed to it just being the same tone of, of brown that's on his back. Um, but, yeah, it still could be something that maybe it's too overdone. I mean, I might just, so I might, might just soften the, the transition a little bit. It goes okay. from brown to off-white um, pretty abruptly. Yeah, I can certainly glaze that that top fur color that kind of, kind of mahogany color but like otherwise this this doggo is pristine my dude it's, you. it's beautiful thank you i was really happy that with paint on him the, um it was hard to tell that i had re-sculpted the whole neck and and everything there i can't tell yeah like just to reposition the way he's looking so he's facing front but you get to see the, his profile on the on the base i'm really proud of that so i had some went through some 
some struggles with um with figuring out which color i wanted to paint him so i looked up all sorts of different kinds of dogs um because he's front and center right but he's also not the most focal point of the whole unit together so i'm like well i could go with a more desaturated color like the gray or a black so black like your dogs or gray like my dogs but then i'm like you might just lose him yeah you know you might just he just might not stand out enough and i wanted and this is enough to where he's still neutrals so he's not like you know kick you in the face look at me because you want your eye drawn up on the piece and so this will allow you to draw it up um without him losing him and then the high marshal on back is running on a horse and i wanted to make sure that there's different colors um for the dog and the horse i didn't want them like both brown or what's both the, what's gray. the horse gonna be i i haven't decided for sure yet but i was leaning more towards like um i did some research and i asked my patreon uh folks um in my weekly videos that i put out there um like what are some like um traditional british horse horse styles or colors and stuff and then i got a lot of interesting information about like well a lot of those are actually um bred or came from uh arabic horses oh. um which is you know that which is why they are that way so I, I ended up doing looking a lot of looking but i like the idea of um i can't remember what kind of horse it is but they're they're gray uh, but they go lighter down the legs so they get to almost like a white as you get to the hoof okay. and then they're kind of darker a little bit darker gray as you get to their rump and then they have the the what do they call it um modeling yeah the the spots yeah. they have spots like white spots on their butt okay um and i thought oh that's nice because then it's the horse itself isn't going to take away from all the fun details and the rider on top but um and then, then they go to almost a black on their muzzle too so there's enough color variation there sometimes they have a really pretty white mane so i might go with that Okay. Yeah, I think one thing that the judges that Ev met are going to love on this dog is just like the the subtle texture. Mm. You know, it's so controlled and it's so right where you want it to be and it's not like it's like to scale, you know, which is like it's impo it's impossible to be to, to scale, but yeah. it's as to scale as it literally can be. Um and it's not it's not ham-fisted at all. Um I think that that part is my favorite part of the paint job. Well, one of my favorite parts. Yeah. Yeah. He's, it was, it was fun to paint. Also when you're putting so much time <laughs> into each of these figures, when a, a dog is, this dog was like, he's 85% of the model is getting the fur, right? That means that once I get past that and I start with painting all its fur, cause I want to really be happy with that. And then when I get beyond that, I don't have this like, Oh, I gotta now paint a sword and paint the, all the cloak and paint all the chain mail and paint like no it's just like he's got a couple other details and as long as i make them crisp and clean and i'm i am specific on the color choices i use i wanted to make sure all his barding his harness was darker right and that the the metallics were rest of the model is warm colors that they accent that with a cooler metallic and so those color choices and you know how much you go with that i thought I was really happy with how it turned out. So, cool, awesome. Okay, so did you? Uh, so this week we're gonna jump into the main topic, but I wanted to ask you before we jump in the main topic, Scott. Mm. Do you want to do the secret snack testing now, or do you want to do it after the main topic? Mm. How hungry are you? <laughs> I'm not too hungry, but I mean, let's do it after. Okay, that's it. This is just our little. Uh, a little, <laughs> little production meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do a, a fun little uh, segment, a snack challenge segment, as we're trying to still figure out what our change of of extra segments gonna be. Because <laughs> the news, you know, it's the yeah, news. Yeah. We don't, you know, we don't care about yeah, news. You don't rely on us for news. <laughs> yeah, if you rely on us for news, man, you gotta re reevaluate your life's choices. Although that being said, James does add more news topics to this thing week after week than we ever did um, yes. by ourselves it's, so it's very valuable and what i think we can probably commit to long term is if it's something that we either really care about that's a news topic or it's something big and important that we'll still talk about it you know we just maybe won't force it as much okay okay 
All right, so Scott, what's our main topic today? Our main topic today is what our title is. Don't fail before you start. So you got a hobby project. It could be something as simple as painting a unit, painting a display model for Golden Demon, anything. And you want to make sure that you have every th all your ducks in a row before you begin within reason. Yep. Um, and that can mean a lot of things from literal physical tools to ideas circulating in your head to paint plans. And we kind of want to talk about what we think about going into a hobby project before we put paint on a model. Yes, I think that's good. And I think for us um, having to, at least my personal experience, from having to have enough things figured out because I'm if I'm painting for a video, I kind of got to get my shit together um, so I can be most uh, efficient and tell the best story or show the important things and, and plan that out a bit in my head for a video. I have found that that process um, has helped me for my own personal projects be more successful because a bit of that planning brain is kind of bled over into my personal stuff. And I'm like, this is good. This is helpful. And so it's just kind of naturally folded in. So maybe we talk about that. Okay, cool. Do you feel that? Do you feel like you've your painting on your own has changed because of the fact that you've made videos? Or maybe yeah. this is the first time you've ever thought about it because I bring it up now? Yeah, definitely. Um, because so much of YouTube is like structured around delivering on an idea about what the video is going to be. Um, it makes you really think about before you start a hobby project, like what model and, and what, what thing is going to deliver on that idea in the best way, how, how you're going to paint it, what tools you're going to use and stuff like that. And so you definitely, I'm, I'm probably in my head to a fault when it comes to painting. I probably should do it a little bit less. I love to, I don't know, maybe it's because of my engineering background, but I love to make math equations out of art. I love to solve things um, and then like go forward with that, that solution. I feel like if I just let my artist brain roam free, I'm doing myself a disservice actually. But if I lie to myself and tell myself that I've solved something, then I'm suddenly more comfortable with the choices that I'm making. I mean, I don't know. There's definitely a middle ground to strike. And I think I'm probably a little bit too much in the camp of overthinking, but, uh, certainly yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I find that um, confidence is a, a good attribute to have in miniature painting. Um, it's in most things in life. You know, yeah. if you feel more confident, if you feel more comfortable, if you feel a level of knowledge that you can, you know, perform this task at work or you can, you know, go to the hardware store and buy the right thing that you're going to need to fix your sink at home, that level of confidence is put less stress on yourself, less anxiety on yourself less pressure and worry on things. And I think that's true in mini painting as well. But you you have to almost kind of like fib to yourself, lie to yourself in, in, a, in a healthy way about knowing it all because <laughs> you'll never know it all, right? You'll never have it all figured out. You'll never know the answer to every question you're going to come across in a paint project before you start. That will never be the case. And the sooner you realize that, it's all kind of on the fly once the plane's in the air, the more you'll kind of just release yourself to that. And so in with that, if you can prep for the things that you don't need to work, so you don't need to worry about these all these extra things on the front end, that means you're going to give yourself freedom to when you're in the project to be like, oh, I really knew that I wanted a gold, uh, like a, a golden armor on this. And I really think that that's going to fit really well for this, army or whatever now i'm on the fly i can think about what color would work well for the cloak because i hadn't really thought about that and now i can just be free and, and come up with those those ad hoc decisions and that's one great spot to start um so i think backpedaling a little bit mm -hmm. you want to have some idea you don't need to have it all figured out um i don't know if we explicitly stated that but that's a great spot to start you have a model in front of you and in your head, you're picturing one or two important colors. If it's a knight and you want to do a full silver NMM or a full gold or copper NMM, that's your big idea. That's where you start in the model. And then once you're accomplishing that and you feel good about that, then you start to paint the other parts of the model that are now in service 
to that main thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that is the most basic thought I have about a hobby project when I get started. Yep. It's like, okay, I'm painting my Cawdor dudes. What are my colors? Okay, I'm going to do a, I don't know, like a split scheme of a putrid green and a warm brown. And that's what I care about. Oh, and also a, a greenish cloth color. Like those are my three colors that I care about. And everything else I'll figure out while I'm painting the model. Once I have those things in place. Because once they're in place, then I can figure out how to frame them, what colors are going to support them well, um, where all the details are in the model. Because sometimes there's a lot of stuff going on in a GW model. And to try to pretend that you can visualize it all in your head before painting it, it's just kind of like, that's just, that's hard to do, right? Right. And you could do the thing where you like print a grayscale model out and color it in card pencils or do that in Photoshop or GIMP or something like that. But to me, that's, that's too much. That's m- maybe for like really important things, but I have never done that kind of thing. Have you ever done that? No. No. Yeah. Cause and like it, you can kind of do a lot of that problem solving on the model live, right? Yes. Yes. You, you start somewhere with a thing. That initial starting point is never going to be wrong, in my opinion. You can always solve that starting point with the decisions that come after that. But that's, you know, that takes a little bit of training about how to solve those problems, how to make certain colors work um, in certain areas of the models and certain volumes across the model and stuff like that. Yeah. And we're explaining this kind of like from our perspective, how we do this. I know people that do that all the time where they go into Photoshop and they paint the model in Photoshop or they they figure out color schemes in Photoshop or or you know just take a picture of the grayscale model and you know do some light tweaks with it to see what they like with that and if that is something that you makes you comfortable or that like gives you makes you excited and gives you that level of confidence to then start painting then do that that's not wrong um but i find that one of the worries about failing before you start is as much under prepping is the other side is over prepping mm-hmm. you know and, and don't get hung up on things if they're going to mean that maybe the painting doesn't happen or maybe you put so much on yourself with all this you know pressure from prep work that it becomes too much and it, there's there's the level of fun has completely been sucked out of it before you even begin. That's your litmus test. If you can't get through the prep because you're either scared to fuck the model up or because you can't solve some problem, you're over preparing, right? Yep. You want to have a direction, a loose direction. And well, I mean, I don't know. It, it depends on who you are, but I need yeah. a loose direction and that's it. Then I just go. Yeah. And yeah. And I think loose direction is a great way to, to phrase it. Your definition of loose direction is something you'll find over time and just be kind of present while you're going through that. And if you're like, God, this sure feels like I'm doing more than I should. Listen to yourself. You probably are. And just say, OK, I know the bronze color for the majority of the armor. I'm going to go with that. And there's something to be said with, with solving problems and making decisions when you have the painted figure in your hand that there you have access to most data. That you will have to make that decision because mm-hmm. you see the exact color and the exact model of how it looks. It's okay to make that decision there. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I have a question for you, Scott, because I found this lately when I'm um, planning for um, my models for the Golden Demon piece is for certain things. When I say I want the cloak to be red, um, I'll find what full array of paints I'm going to use for that. Oh, like a little triad? Yeah, whether it's, it's okay, I'm going to actually use this dark burgundy for the shadows. It's going to be Mephiston Red is the main one, and I'm going to punch it up with the red by Chimera. I'm actually, guys, just giving you the recipe for the cloak I just painted for my dude. <laughs> um, and then for edge highlights, I'm going to add the red and maybe some um, sunny skin tone to have that punchy little just chink edge highlights on the cloak where it would hit. Do you go through that in your prep step? For knowing the full thing, do you do it just sometimes? Do you do it never? It's a sometimes thing for me. Yeah. What m- mostly what I'm trying to figure out is what I want the midtone of each object to be, the thing that the object ends up really looking like, um, and then like ancillary stuff like uh, a colored shadow or a tinted highlight. That to me um, helps me pull the overall scheme in one direction or another so it's like if i'm painting a green shawl 
and I want everything in the scheme to be warm because I want to draw attention to cold skin tones on the model. Then I'm going to use a warm brown shadow for that sickly green and a, and a, and a warm yellow highlight for that sickly, sickly green so I can support that decision that I'm making now. Um, but I'm, I might not know that ahead of time. That might be a thing that I figure out while painting. Um, or, or I may know that ahead of time and I, I may pull it out. Sometimes, I, though, I, I rely on certain colors to be mostly highlights um, very often, like that sunny skin tones, that Vallejo ice yellows. Mm -hmm. So that is a bit of an autopilot decision that I often make and maybe isn't good. I think it. I think it's just fine. Okay, I, yeah. I, I think sometimes, like, though, you're going to have those autopilot moments and you need to rely on those so you don't get overwhelmed with all the data and the decision making. That's true. Yeah. You know? Now, when you're going into a project where you need to have things more cohesive, you, you're, you, you're having some environmental effect, some ambiance to the piece or something like mm, this, yeah. where there's going to be something that's going to be shown through all the models. Um, example for this, for this Golden Demon piece, I have a universal shadow tone for the entire scene, and it's like a really deep plum color. And so I need to know that going into the project that each figure that we're going to be glazing in with shadows and even my base colors, I mix in a bit of just a little bit of that color with the base colors. Um, so it's just like, it's just faintly present through the whole piece. And if I didn't make that choice until I was like three figures in, I can't go back in and undo that. So if you're like, Oh, you know what? I kind of want it to be this really a funky uh, fire just off scene. Well, that's going to affect your whole paint experience and your decision making once you dig into it so you you'll want to know that prior to putting any of the paint on the model it's part of like your fun little creative what's my planning of what's going to make this model unique what am i going to try to do here yeah there definitely are certain techniques and ideas that require more preparation if you want to do osl with an, an nmm figure like in my opinion i would want to do the nmm first and then work the OSL on top of my predefined highlights so I could like get that glow uh, showing on that armor in the right way. If I did the OSL first, and then I was trying like, like a red OSL, and I was trying to work in like grayish highlights kind of on top of that OSL, I would just end up going back and forth with the red to try to marry the two. So there are certain things definitely, especially OSL, that require a little bit more thinking beforehand. Um, one thing that I thought about when you first brought this up was airbrushing. Mm. Um, I have lately been asking myself the question on every single model is like, how long can I use the airbrush on this model before being required to turn to the paintbrush? And a lot of the runtime of the airbrush is dependent on order of operations, not only on what parts of the model you're painting, but also what colors you're using. So very generally, this is not going to apply to everything, but some basic rules you could apply are obviously the first colors you're going to be using are the darker colors mm -hmm. and you're going to work up to brighter values. So that's the order of operations there. Um, secondly, you're going to work on details that are on the top of the model, working down the model or extraneous to the model. So they're not part of the main body to avoid things like overspray. And you can use very basic masking, like a piece of paper, if things do become problematic. So, for instance, my Cotor guys is top of mind. Um, they have a green shawl. They have khaki-like pants. And so that's a little bit difficult because the khaki pants are lower on the model than the green shawl. Mm -hmm. And so if I were to do that last, then when, when painting the green, or sorry, when painting the white, I might get some overspray on the feet and stuff like that. And so it requires some thinking. But those are some general rules for airbrushing. Start dark to light, uh, no matter what the details are, and then start with the big details that are high on the model that would cause the most overspray. Do those first, and then work down the model, and then also work out the model to arms and wings and things that you can easily airbrush without causing tons of overspray. Okay, so you're almost working like in to out. You're working more towards like the core 
and and out to appendages out towards the outside of in all directions yeah yeah i just want to ask the question how can i avoid the most overspray yeah. if i get a little a little bit overspray honestly i used to think as a noob i was like overspray is awful i need to either mask everything off or just not use the airbrush that's totally bullshit um no yeah. one notices tiny amounts of overspray at all and and even a simple like glaze or you know just something with the brush quick yep can can cover that so much if if it wasn't such an effective tool to be used at so much further along in the paint job than we're probably comfortable with then then people that have kind of like made their success and their brand and their notoriety on it people like uh sergio calvo and angel Geraldez that they use airbrush like I just even watch their shorts and their videos and stuff, and I'm just like, man, I'm way beyond my comfort level of where you're bl busting out the airbrush on these projects. And their paint jobs are fucking phenomenal. Yeah. So it, know that it's possible, you know. But uh, you know, I, I'm still at the point where like, I'm gonna use the airbrush as much as I can to really define the main color. Yeah. And then I'll go back in with the brush for everything else. It's especially easy with things like Space Marines where they're like 90 percent one <laughs> color anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. and that's a great way to start a great way to really kind of get your legs under you of understanding how to, to use an airbrush yeah, and Space Marine and further and further is, is something that's a majority one color. Yeah. I want to add one exception to that. That general rules I just added uh, when I was painting my skeletons, I learned the value of this idea of like a general shadow color that can be used for all colors on the scheme. So I had a red and I had a silver and I had like a, a, a whitish, greenish bone color. And for all three of those colors, a dark navy blue is a totally suitable shadow color. And so when I had finished airbrushing uh, all those tones, I came back in with a translucent navy blue. I think it was a contrast paint or it was, a, I think it was a, con it was a, a Vallejo Speed Express? Er, Express color. Express color? It was one of those caused dry tip like a motherfucker i don't know what's in those paints but um they they, they clog up really fast fucking sand <laughs> it's fucking sand <laughs> uh <laughs> sand in their paints um but yeah that color works as a shadow for everything on the scheme and so overspray doesn't matter because like if i'm trying to like paint a line like in between his cloak and his thigh armor i don't care if i get blue on both those things that's the point yeah um so overspray is good in that case so that is another little handy way to to deal with overspray yeah the there's such a big like level up moment for me and my mini painting when i realized that the shooting from below an interesting shadow color that would be a universal shadow color that just like it covers everything and just gives you that nice fun fun fade of across all the surfaces that you've put the the colors on um is such a nice thing and it's just like oh it makes it look like i'm a way better painter than i am <laughs> because I, I made this i made this decision of it's not just darker in the shadows it is darker but it's also you can just see that hint, hint of that dark blue and how that blue reacts to the green is different than how it reacts to the cream which is different than how it act, reacts to the gray so you get all these fun new nuanced tones of those colors on top of each other yet they all feel in the same family so yeah the directional airbrush shadow from below after your base coats primo step <laughs> primo step all right what's the next thing people can kind of plan out you know i was thinking too is like you know we're talking a lot about the the, the project from the kind of the real details of this project and that can that can include other things of like the basing you know like oh what do, I, I should figure out if this is going to be part of a unit what's their story what's the army's plan what kind of planet are they on what kind of environment are in those are important things too but i think y'all probably already do that that kind of is a natural part of mini painting um i kind of think about when i'm sitting down or i'm, I'm doing this prep step of like what are my expectations of myself mm. i think it's important for you to really be honest with yourself because that way you don't come halfway through and you're like that's what she said um <laughs> oh, no um Not where you're like uh you. <laughs> where you're like oh man i'm like six hours into this and i've got to do 25 more of these yeah. like really define it for yourself and be like okay this is a unit of 10 and i've got to have to paint a whole another 40 more models for the army what's my time expectation what's my quality my quality for myself whatever my level is at 
what what percentage ball sack? Really, look on your wall to your your top branded ball sack meter. <laughs> it should be a poster you all own by now. Um, you you don't, but we really need to make it. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, and just understand, okay, where on the ball sack meter am I going to be for this? Like, how much time? How much effort? And more importantly than that, even it's like I'm going to give myself five hours or maybe don't even set a time out. Just like how much effort am I putting in for this? And and not only that, but then where is my focus of that time? I'm like, ah, this is going to be kind of a quick paint for me. You know, I know I've got a lot of these guys. I want them to look good at the table, um, but I don't want to spend very much time. So I'm going to kind of go through them kind of quickly. But I need to remind myself that they're they're awesome flaming swords needs to be really important to really make them pop at the table. So I'm going to put a little bit more time in that, or I'm going to prep myself a little bit more of like, I'm going to plan out the five colors from a deep, deep red up to even a pure white. And then a glaze of a contrast paint thin down over the whole thing to really just kind of pull it together at the end. And I'm going to spend more time on that flaming sword because that's, what's really going to make this punch at the table. So setting your expectations of, what is this project in the grand scheme of things for you for time and effort? And where are you going to pull your punches? And where are you going to really dig in and say, this is what's going to make this one look good? That's honestly been such, this is going to sound so exaggerative. That's such a liberating thing for me is because like when I was just getting started in painting and I want to talk about this in a little bit, I only knew how to go full ball sack all the time. Mm-hmm. And then when I realized that I could be happy with my paint jobs, um, not doing that. And then when I realized that, Oh, I can, I can still paint a model really nicely if I want to, and then paint other ones, not as nicely. And they actually still work together really well. Yeah. Um, Cause like with, when I was painting that kill team, I was like, I'm going to paint the, I don't know if you call it a matriarch. I'm going to paint it really nicely. And then all the other novitiates, are going to be painted not as nicely, um, but they still work together as a squad really well. And that first initial paint job allowed me to discover a lot about what I wanted the scheme to look like. Um, and so it, it also it doesn't need to be uniform across your entire project, depending on what it is. Um, you can put more effort into one thing and then less effort into other things. Kind of like it's kind of like what you're saying about an individual model putting effort into the sword but not into the guy. This is putting effort into an individual, but not the rest of the unit. So a little bit more zoomed out. Yeah. Now, that being said, and I want to get your thought on this, John. I bet there are a lot of painters out there. They're like, you know what? I don't know how to not try as hard as I can. Because yeah. maybe I'm new to this, you know? Yeah. And I, I'm not very good yet. And so, like, if everything I Everything takes me a long time. Everything. Or, yeah. So to them, are we just saying ignore this or interpret it differently? Yeah. Um. I, th- I think I think that's a really good point. Hmm. I think the thing that I would say for that is, um, and I was the exact same way. I painted. That's Stormcast. Yeah, I painted the best I could at, at the beginning because, well, I don't, I don't know how good I can paint. I'm obviously brand new. I'm not going to be that good, so I should just try to get good, and that you get good by trying your best. And mm-hmm. I think that is a great approach. Um but give yourself some some leeway. Don't don't be too harsh on yourself of feeling like I, I need to, you know, put six hours into the the pants and boots on this guy. It's like, no, you're gonna burn yourself out when you do that, you know. Um I I think it's important to be like, I'm just completely lost my train of thought. So <laughs> um yeah, I don't I don't think you need to worry about about that, about, you know, understanding is as good or as bad um you know as yeah you just paint campaign just paint just paint it i think the more that you'll, you'll be x number of models in and you'll realize that point that you just you just found out yeah you know you'll you'll find a couple of things that you can do things faster and you're still happy with it yeah and maybe as a beginner your version of putting full ball sack into a model versus not is you know what i'm gonna slap chop this entire unit and that's like me not putting in effort and then when I do want to put an effort, I'm going to paint a model a regular way. And you know what? It may end up looking worse than my slap chop example. But what you lose in quality of outcome, you gain in knowledge. And the more you do that, the more you paint in a regular shadow, midtone, highlight kind of way, 
the more you start to grow this part of your hobby, which really unlocks more freedom and choice, right? You're not, you're not stuck with one approach to the hobby. Now you have multiple that you can take to get different outcomes. So maybe, maybe for you, that's what putting full ball sack in is. It's, it's trying a new thing, learning and failing at it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I've been watching this TV show lately. So we, we wa- we got just got done watching the seasons of the Great British Baking Show Kids Edition. Oh, nice! So there's only two seasons of that on um, on Netflix. So then we started watching this show on HBO Max. That it's it's Great British Baking Show, but instead of it, it's the exact same format, exact same style, exact same dry ass British people, but it's <laughs> it's about pottery instead of baking. Is it the same host and stuff? No, it's okay, not the same host, yeah. but it's. I think it's the same, like, Channel 4, okay. um, whatever, worldwide. No, that's that's Channel 5. Um, it's, But it follows the same format and, and, and everything. And first of all, it's I can't remember what it's called. Just look up Pottery Reality Show UK or something. I can't remember what it's called. But it's really good. It's really interesting, and it's it reminds me, because I did, uh, I took three pottery classes in high school. Um, because yeah, my, three? Yeah, well, my my third one was a independent study where it was just I just I had many art independent studies as a senior, <laughs> or all I did is fucking I fucking see what you're doing, bro. I did a fucking art for an hour and a half, and um, but yeah, so uh, I remember it brought me back how fucking hard it is to throw clay on a wheel. Yeah, it is so it's it's all feel. It is all like you can't watch a video. You can't watch somebody right next to you, an expert that's been doing this for 30 years. You can't watch them throw a ball of clay, hit the pedal, and just feel it centered and pull up. Like, you have to do it. Yeah. You have, and, and I'm watching because these people are relative, they're all, they're not like pro potters. They're just, they do it at home. It's their hobby or whatever. And there are various levels of, of how far, they, how experienced they are. But it reminds me of miniature painting of when you're new. And when you're just figuring stuff out, like you just do it the best you can and you'll learn as you go. And you're not going to be able to crank out 40 mugs in an hour at the beginning and make them shittier mugs. You're just going to make two mugs in an hour if you're lucky, but you learned a lot more with those two. And so worrying about speed at the very beginning will be at the expense of the quality of your work long term and if you're enjoying the process which is the most important thing of any hobby we do is you have fun doing it the speed is just going to come it'll be it's it's a natural progression that all of us will go through and not put your pressure on that so watch the pottery show and (laughs) And try to make internalize those lessons just try to make one mug an hour don't make don't make 10 shitty ones in an hour just make one and be happy with that one because you're going it's going to make you faster for your next mug yeah <laughs> now a little bit less into the art side of it um it's really it's not important but it's really helpful when you get into a flow state when you start painting mm. and a, a way to encourage that and to uh prohibit you losing that is by having all of the tools you need around you and removing distractions right yeah that is such a good one one that i think it's it's kind of i would say it's obvious but it should not be understated how valuable it is yeah you need to put effort into this it's not like a natural thing at least not for me like i need to put my phone somewhere else and i need to grab everything that i think i'm going to use and stuff like that have music on yep have something that's not distracting you, especially not your eyes. Um, if you have to keep glancing up at the screen to pay attention to the the YouTube shows that you're watching, you're you're pulling your attention away, and it may not seem like it's you're losing some of that magic, um, but you are. You're 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 pulling your your distractions are pulling your attention away enough to where you may have missed an aha moment or just a little learning moment or just an area that like, Oh, I just needed a little bit more here that you're, you're pulling yourself from. So yes, I, um, uh, I will listen to podcasts. I'll listen to music or I will rewatch movies that are like my favorite movies that I've watched a dozen times. Mm. Um, because I can just listen. Um, and then I can mentally check out and, and I, sometimes I will realize like, 
oh man, like 10 minutes have gone by and the podcast is still rolling and I don't, I didn't listen to anything they said. <laughs> and that's good. That means that I got in, I, I hit the wave at yes. some point and I was just sucked in and I'm just engaged. And that's why music is a great one too. You don't need to be an active listener trying to decipher the artist's in, intentions in the lyrics. Like you don't have to do that. And um, yeah, that's, that's really important. And having that physical space. Now, if you don't have a dedicated space for painting, whether you just paint on your kitchen table and so you got to drag your stuff in and out or whatever, you can still prep. You can still set yourself up for success for being um, precise in this is my little, um, f you know, like my tackle box, my fishing tackle box that's got all my stuff in. I got the brushes on this drawer. I got all the glues on here. I got this. I just put it on the table. I open it up. I put my light out. You set your routine. So you have your space. You have your stuff. You never are jumping back and forth to the, the bedroom to find another paints or whatever. It's like I'm bringing these paints out because I'm going to use them. And I'm going to crank out all these cloaks tonight. And so the more you pull yourself away, the more likely you are to kind of like jar yourself free from that state of I'm here to paint. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be tough, but uh, I think having everything uh, around you. And if you have a space, it's like it's also my computer desk. And it's my painting station, which I think is true for a lot of us. I mean, technically, mine is the same way. It's my computer desk slash my studio slash my editing rig slash my whatever. But you can still design that space to be efficient where it's it's still good for a computer desk. And it's still great for my um, my mini painting. I can make sure I do an undermount on my desk for my keyboard so I can slide that in. And I have a full blank space that's inevitably filled with bits and fucking paint pots of paint all the time so you can also if you have like someone who lives with you um you can be like hey i'm gonna be doing this for like an hour if you could let me try to do it for an hour without asking me any questions that'd be amazing and hopefully they'll be understanding of that but that also helps to prepare to like kind of get engaged in the process yeah and i think that's one of the big but well, the big important things um for for painting is like not only uh, having open communication with a roommate, whether it's a spouse, whether it's, you know, your kids, whether it's whomever, your friends, um, but also with yourself and preparing to say like, OK, when you're at work and you're kind of zoning off at work because you're bored for a little while, you're like, I really want to paint tonight. I'm going to paint. I love to paint from like 7 to 9 p.m. tonight. So block that time off mentally for yourself or even put it on your own calendar on your phone or something that like if I do this and I commit to it because I know I want to do it and I know I have something I want to accomplish. If I block it off for myself, that's the first step. Then I can open communications of, hey, I was going to paint tonight. Does that work for our calendar or whatever? I'm going to make sure I get the dishes done first and then whatever. Uh, help with homework and then I'm going to do that. You know, if you're if you're a, a good partner in your life with, with other things that you need to do and then you have that time committed to yourself, then you can just dig in and get get the most out of that time. And also... Don't put the pressure on yourself of I must finish X tonight in those two hours. Just be like, I'm going to sit down. This is my goal. And I'm just going to get in the, the flow state and just go. I think the more experienced you are in painting, the more reasonable it is for you to commit to a specific goal. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the the more of a beginner you are, it's just about the experience mm -hmm. and the learning and education. Just paint. Yeah. But if you're like, I'm going to finish this guy's weapon tonight, like that's a that's a fine commitment. You can have that commitment. It's, sometimes, it's, it's good to have restrictions sometimes, uh, time restrictions especially, because that happens or it, you know, it enables creativity, it enables creative solutions to, to accomplish your goals in that set uh, time frame. So that can be helpful as well. It, it pushes you over roadblocks. Yeah. Sometimes you get in a roadblock in a painting project um, where it's just like, ugh, I just, it, the easiest and quickest solution is to just put it down and not face it and just, I'm just not going to deal with this right now. And that doesn't keep you painting. And in the more you go through those roadblocks, the more you realize they're not so bad. They're not. Those hills aren't so big. No problem is unsolvable. No thing should really stress you out so much. But if you have some kind of a constraint of like, I've got a game this weekend. I got to get this unit painted. Guess what? You're much more likely to get that unit painted. Otherwise, that's how that's how a unit goes from being done in a week to two and a half months later it, it's still not done because you got to some kind of a mental roadblock and you didn't push through it. 
Yeah. Um, the other thing about being okay with being done with something, like maybe you're fussing with a blend and like you're unsatisfied with it, but you had a commitment to have something done by a certain time. And so you, you say it's done despite yourself and despite your expectations. And then you start playing with a model or you put it in your display shelf and like come back to it two days later, a week later. And you're like, you know what? That didn't matter. What I cared about didn't matter. And now you just learn something about yourself and your expectations for your art. Now you know that unless you're trying to reach some competitive standard, you don't need to stress over every single thing that you thought you needed to. And you can still create a model that you that you like. Or the opposite will happen. And you'll be like, you know what? I really wish I did work on that blend. And I wish I really did have it look beautiful. Either way, you're going to learn something about yourself, which is going to inform how you're going to paint in the future. Yep. And no model is ever 100% done if you don't want it to be. Mm -hmm. There is there is no paint job that you can't make a little better. There is no uh, model that you've played a game with that you can't add another color to, that you can't repaint over, that you can't add more depth, that you can't add some fluo paints and make it shinier. You can do that at any time. It's it feels weird. This is not like an uh, like a old timey canvas painting where then you've got to like varnish and seal the whole thing in and then it just kind of is it's, it's, it's just done you know like it's it is what it's ever going to be um it, which you can still do that with paintings too so maybe that's a bad example but <laughs> but the, the point is we think like once we put it on the shelf or once we put the magnet on the base and we put it in our, our tray to take to a game like that has to be done it yeah. doesn't have to be and sometimes even if you will never come back to it you'll never put a paintbrush on it again just telling yourself that you could, if you wanted to, you always can, is enough to get over a, a hurdle of it's not good enough, too. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I'll admit that I, I definitely struggle to come back to stuff. I know it's an option, but for some reason, it's not something I want to do. You know, I want to just move on to New Horizons. There's always another cool model to paint. Yeah. There's always something that excites you more because you haven't started yet and you haven't felt those pain points of the hurdles with that model. Guess what? They're in that model too. But that's okay. <laughs> You'll get through those too. Um, but it's like, yeah, you have you have all the weight of all this, the, the problems and the struggles and the, the blend or the color didn't work right or the eyes look like shit. Or, you have all those with the, some, the thing you did paint. You don't have them with the thing you haven't started painting. <laughs> but just being okay with that and being like, hey, if that excites you, jump to the next one. Or... You know, spend some more time. Whatever, whatever floats your boat. Yeah. All right. I think we covered that pretty well. God, yeah. I feel this one felt like a little bit more serious, more heavy one, and I don't think we walked into it thinking it was going to be that. No. But I think it's the Goody Peepees. You may or may not know this, but we're selfish, and we uh, speak for yourself. <laughs> I'm definitely not. <laughs> we um, we go into these topics or discussions or we choose them based on things that we think we're going to have the most fun talking about but i often find by the end of them i'm like well the things we talk about i'm reminding myself of things or i'm learning from your perspective which gets me thinking about things in a different way so i always feel coming out of this this isn't just like here we know these things let me just put them in a package and give them to you i always feel like especially topics like this where there's a little bit more depth to them or i'm like gosh yeah i need to remind myself of that too i need to remind myself that it's like just it just it's okay and it's more fun for them to all have some paint on them on the table sometimes yeah definitely also i think we started this discussion by saying that over planning is a mistake and then obviously this is a podcast so we proceeded to talk about <laughs> we over plan for you for yeah, the last yeah. hour <laughs> yeah you don't need to do all of these things. No. You get to pick and choose what you think is going to work for you. Um, and you might try all these things out on various projects and might discover that some things work for you and modifications of some of these suggestions work for you and stuff like that. So these are just uh, ideas that you get to add to your arsenal and uh, change them as you see fit. Yeah, this is yeah, that's the joy of this being an art and not a math equation where there is one answer at the end. And if you don't get the answer at the end, that's the right one. Then you did it wrong. It sucks that's, for me, man. <laughs> that is not how it works. So you'll find your own groove and what works and doesn't work for you. Um, I think just the general path that we talked about today is a good starting path. OK, is it time for a snack review? Oh, boy. The, the name of this snack is ridiculous. So we got we went to the Asian food store 
always a great time. Weekend. Always a great time. They're so I spend uh, my problem is my daughter's as bad as me, and she loves picking out the weirdest shit to try. <laughs> so this was her choice. Like all those weird drinks and yeah. chips and all oh, these candies. Yeah, she likes candy. these things that are like jelly. In a little, like a little straw, but they're like they they look like a fucking worm, and she's like sucks them up. Um, I don't know. Um, she's she's against anything that's fish or water based flavored. So like she doesn't want any of the octopus chips. Uh, she doesn't want any of the, the squid flavored ramen. She doesn't want any. Yeah, she doesn't like that stuff. That's what I get, dude. When I go, I get like six different kinds of ramen. Just oh to yeah, try we them do all that. Out. Yeah. We do that, but and she's she she's getting into the spicier stuff. So anyway, she picked out these, and these are potato twists, and they're called Lonely God, <laughs> and it's a picture of a fucking cherub a little, baby with wings. A little uh, East Asian uh, cherub. I love it. Potato twist, tomato flavor. I think Lonely God is the most badass name for, like, a villain. Lonely God. Yeah. It feels like it would be a miniature for Kingdom Death. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. So, Poots, if you're watching this, dude. Free idea, bud. Free idea. The Lonely God, and you have to make some horrific morph <laughs> of this that, cherub does that, baby. Does that thing have fangs or no? Am I, am I no, not saying? No fangs. No fangs. Okay. It is carrying what looks like a wand with a star on the end. Okay. And he's he's flying over this little village and dropping stars out of his butthole. Um, so to, tomato flavored potato twists. All right, get available in, in a Chinese grocer near you. Yeah. All right. What do we got? What do we got? All right, a little bit thicker. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a twist. It's like a. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you sit there for a second. I'm gonna have one. Okay. That's pretty good. <laughs> what? That's pretty good. It like it doesn't kinda, it taste like tomato soup? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> uh, mostly just kind of salty MSG goodness, but it kind of melts in your mouth, similar to a Pringle, but yes. like better though. Yes, because it's potato like a Pringle, but it's like they squished it down into whatever. It's the reconstituted potato. Yeah, potato patties that they like had them go through this little squeezer thing. Here, pour, pour me out some. Pour them out for your homies there. All right, fucking relax, but we're on a podcast. I can't eat chips for days. Yeah, these are good though. They're salty. There's a little sweetness of the tomato, a little, a little vinegary, yeah, a little acidity, um, and a nice texture. I'd slam that back in a, in a yeah, dude. Easy. Yeah, and they're like it was like a a dollar nineteen. I mean, because everything is cheap there. So now we're gonna have to go back to the Asian grocery store. So, so first of all, we went to a winery. To play bingo. I'm sorry, this is a thing my in laws told us about where you go play. That is such a Midwestern yeah. thing. So it's a local winery in Minnesota, and they do in the winter time. Uh, they do a bingo every Sunday, and if you if you win bingo, you win a bottle of wine, <laughs> and their bottles are like they're like thirty forty dollars a bottle. So there's eight games, and last Sunday you can bring kids with, but I guess kids can't win. So my daughter won two of the eight games. So she won two bottles of wine. So then we would like take her car and go up and we'd get our bottle of wine. So she said, because I I won two bottles of wine, that I've got to take her back to the Asian grocery store to get more snacks. So I'm like, deal. So dude, two out of eight is incredible. Dude, she was how, how many kids? Was it like 20, 50, oh, 10? The amount of people that were playing. Uh so there was probably 70 people there. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, Holy we had shit. a we had a real good day. So in our group, there's like eight of us in the group, and we won four games of the eight games. That is awesome. Yeah, so we were we were riding high on that wine. Um, so yeah, a, long story short, might have another snack <laughs> next, <laughs> next time. I have a bingo related story. Okay. So as you know, uh, and as the goody peepees know, I am forced to watch Love Island at gunpoint. Um, and that's not true. <laughs> no, I love it. Uh, but I have noticed that these people have very similar vocabularies. Um, there are common phrases and words that are reused season after season. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually 
It's kind of mind numbing a little bit. Is there? Is it's from Australia, isn't it? Well, there's all kinds of different ones. The main one is from the UK. Okay. Um, but there is an Australian one, and that one is more unhinged than the UK one, and often is better to watch. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. There's also an American one. There's tons of other ones too. Because the Australians all just came from as being prisoners and from the, the UK, right? And it shows, baby. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're all awesome. in the best way possible. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I, I I've been watching the show for a while, and I've been collecting a list of common phrases okay. uh, that occur in the wow. TV show. And I got to a point where I had enough to make four four by four bingo cards of these phrases. Four by four? <laughs> five by five? That's bingo. Yeah, five by five. Five by five. Um, bingo cards. And we watched an episode. And I, I didn't know how to like... You know, there's I could like try to figure out which one of these phrases occur most often and are less often and like kind of balance the cards correctly. But after one episode, someone had a oh, someone almost had a bingo. And after two episodes, two people had bingos. I think that's a pretty good rate. Yeah, it's good. Um, but it worked, man. They say these fucking things all the time. Um I don't know what that says about people on that show, but... Um, Can you give me some examples of things uh, that they oh, say? Okay. They often say 100% as like confirmation. 100%. They'll say, I'm a slow burner. They'll say, it's just <laughs> like this relationship, it's just easy. We don't have to force it. We just click. We'll just see where it goes. I'm buzzing. To be fair, to be honest, they say in it a lot. In it. They say, do you know what I mean? <laughs> like all as one word, like so fast. They say, it's early days slash early doors. They ask the question on fucking repeat, where's your head at? Um, what does that even mean? They mean, like, how do you feel about this relationship? Where's right your head at? Yeah, they'll often say uh, family orientated instead of family. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's fucking what... hate. Oh. <laughs> I, I don't know. Okay, I don't know about etymology and, like, words and stuff. But, like, part of me feels like English people have. You said words incorrectly, and they have now become canon in the English language, <laughs> like aluminium and orientated and isopropanol. I, I don't know if this is true, but I, th I thought the words were aluminum, isopropyl, and oriented. Um, and then, but these are now in the dictionary. These words, they just mean to say the same thing. They spell differently. Yeah. Oh God! So maybe I could be wrong. Maybe these ones, these, these are the original words, and we fucking changed it. Like I don't know. Um, but uh, there's, I mean, I could go on forever. Um, there's at least fifty here. Um, oh yeah. my God! You're a bit of me. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. That's that's a bit of me. That's a, that's a that's one. That's a classic British one. I need to I need to work in where's your head at more often. <laughs> Is that just fun? That sounds like an insult. <coughs> Why? Where's your head at? Oh, because you're like you're like you're losing it. Yeah, you're like accusatory. Like, where's your like you're <laughs> off your goddamn rocker? Where's your head at? Maybe it's all in the tone, right? How you ask it. Yeah, context is huge. Like, I don't know. I don't think that there's a way I could I could ask that question to my wife where she wouldn't be pissed at me. That's how I know. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> hey, sweetie, where's your head at? Because <laughs> you've clearly lost it. Yeah, that that's that. Yeah, that's the dot dot dot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's what you get when you're between the lines. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's good. That's good stuff. So now we we got snacks. We got uh, we got Love Island bingo. We got wine. <laughs> And uh, now we. What more do you need? What more do we need? We where we're gonna go is we're gonna go to the after party and we're gonna be right back to finish up this episode. Welcome to the end of the episode. No shill here, but a fun story to share with you that I forgot to share earlier on. Bonus story for making it all the way through the episode. Hell yeah! Uh, me and Eons of Battle have prepared a little a year long collaboration. Uh, he reached out to me. He was like, hey you want to do a meeting with me and i was like what uh, this is very formal um and so we did the meeting and he was like you know what you and i both have dark eldar armies we both want them to get painted what do you say we do a little friendly competition over the year with various milestones in each quarter to have a 2000 point army painted by the end of the year and because that aligned with what my goals were for this year i was like i should say yes to this this is going to have deadlines that encourage me to finish the thing that i want to finish yeah um and we had this idea where like everything you do for your army is worth a certain number of points 
Oh, it's and, like army building. Yeah. Um, and so it's actually a weird GW system where they have this, where like you paint a model, you get a point, you assemble a model, you get a point. Weird you lick like the that. model, you get a half a point. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's weird stuff. And so by the end, we're going to see who has the most points and who wins. Um, and like converting a model is worth a certain number of points, <laughs> painting it nicely or whatever, whatever you want to call it. You just need to figure out what this point system is the and then how to fucking game it. Yeah. Well, apparently, so buying a model is worth points. So the way you fucking game it <laughs> is you just buy the whole goddamn range ten times, and now I've won. Yeah. Um, They're just you just at the end of the video, it's just all the boxes <laughs> stuck stood up. I'm like, I'm the fucking winner. <laughs> Absolutely, dude. Uh, so me and Jay, and I think he's already talked about this in one of his uh, his uh, videos where he's like holding the, the tablet and just chatting with his audience. Mm -hmm. um, he's already talked about this. Um, but yeah, so we uh, quarter one for me is completing, I forget what they're called. They're the 500 point combat patrol. Yeah. Uh, completing a combat patrol list for Dark Eldar, which required me to read into the list writing rules for 40k and figure out uh, what 500 points of Dark Eldar look like. Now, Combat Patrol are specific um, specific units, so I'm not doing exactly uh, that, but I'm using what I've already painted and adding on to it to have 500 points. Um, and my first experience with this running in 40K is that it's easier than Age of Sigmar, um, but that it's strangely prohibited, uh, prohibitive. Um, for instance... Uh, Drazar can only go into a unit of Incubi. Uh, uh, a Succubus can only go into a unit of Witches. And because Witches fucking suck, that means you never take Succubuses, which sucks for me because that's the only HQ that I have painted. Um, but, like, it'd be so cool to have a Succubus in a unit of Incubi. It just makes sense. They're both close combat monsters. Like, why would they not go together? And like a raider or something. Um, oh yeah, that. Why can't you? Just why can't I put any character in any why, unit? Why can't I play the toys that I want to play with? It's it's a little bizarre. I, I don't know if anything like that exists in Age of Sigmar. You can well, you don't put characters in units anyways. No. Um, you didn't used to put. Um, you didn't used to put heroes HQs in in units. And the last time I played was at Ninth Edition. Or eighth edition. Or really? Eight, yeah. That's, that's been a thing for a long time in the old versions of the game and in oh, fantasy. Well, no, but they had like the they had the breakdowns of like the you pick the what do they call like tip the arrow tip <laughs> formation and that included like one fast attack and then one HQ or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, but it wasn't specific units. No, no, no. That's that, that now never it's specific units. Well, the the formation has never told you where your HQ choice can go, but now it states in the units entry the what units it can go into. And I I believe that yeah, the, those ones are really prohibited. I think the Archon, like the main HQ choice for a Dark Elder faction, is a little bit looser. He can go into a warrior sure. unit. He can go into an NQB unit. I can't I can't fully remember. But it was just weird. I was like, wh wh why is that? Is it because like there are certain combos that are broken? I, I didn't know. Combo. <laughs> but I got a list. I need to paint 10 NQB. Okay. And What is the plural of Incubus? Or Incubi? Incub Incubinus? Incubatotomus. Incubinus. Um, incubi sounds right. Or Incubinus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What'd you paint today? Oh, I, I, I painted a whole fucking sack of Incubinus. A lot of Venus. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta paint ten of those guys and three more Reavers. They're no longer called Reaver jet bikes. They're just called Reavers. Dude, those jet bikes are hot. They're so fucking cool. Um, I love them. Um, I have such big plans for this Dark Eldar army. I'm fucking seeing the Matrix right now. Oh, baby. Um, I don't want to. I want to talk about any of it because it's gonna make me feel like I'm accomplishing it, and I'm not at all yet. Because <laughs> um, I got, I got fucking videos to edit, bro. I can't work. I can't work on this yet. But uh, I'm gonna come out of the gates, going. I think uh, I'm ready to rock. Um, just like a, just like a dark elf on a and a flying jet ski. Yeah, or you know, uh, meow, meow. a Drakari, not a dark elf. Meow. Get it right, man. Meow. Meow. Yeah. That's gonna be it for this one. Because you can't trademark Dark Elf. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Someone already made that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for hanging out all the way to the episode. Thank you again for all of your support. Those of you that, that join us on Patreon. Those of you that pick up a Tup shirt. Those of you that tell your nerd friends about us. We appreciate each and every one of you. That's what we appreciate about you. 
<laughs> That's all we got for today. We do have an exciting guest coming for the next episode of Trapped Under Plastic, all the way from the foreign land of Arizona. Ooh. So you're going to have to wait and see and maybe hit up the Trapped Under Plastic Facebook group and try to f see what you think. Maybe talk amongst yourselves and see if you can figure out who our mystery guest will be. It's a good hint. That's a good hint. Yeah. I don't know if everyone knows where this person lives, but I think some people probably some will. Some people will. Yeah. Some people will. So, yeah, if you go over there, I mean, you got to know where at least somebody's probably going to have it figured out. Yeah. So, uh, until then, we'll catch you on the flippity flop. <laughs>